to many of our fellow patriots. We stand firmly planted in a spiritual tradition committed to freedom in the deeper sense. And who better to understand its nature and value than those most often and most readily deprived of its blessings. We are here because we are devoted to the ideals of justice and equality as indicated in the noblest articulations of the American ideal, but not as mere abstractions to be touted, touted emptily in idolatrous celebrations of an ideal American self that does not now nor has ever existed. We are here to simply, we are here not to simply reinforce rhetorical commitments to abstract principles proclaimed in high places that never managed to trickle down to the least of these, yeah. but to demand practical responses to the concrete failures of our republic, to guarantee these realities in everyday experience. <clears throat> so it can be said indeed, all lives matter in the abstract, but clearly you must be reminded that black lives matter in the concrete. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The African-American Christian church occupies a uniquely strategic position in the present situation being seated at the spiritual center of a political whirlwind now rocking the foundation of the American Republic. A whirlwind driven, we firmly believe, by the unfinished business of America's stormy legacy of white racism and its perniciously tornadic spawn. As the Christian church, we in principle stand apart from those on the left and the right. As the body of Christ, we do not serve as mere mascots of the liberal left, yeah. yes, sir. sent by patronizing paternalists to serve as the point on the head of their ideological spear. Mm. Nor do we set horses with those of the religious right who hide their rampant <laughs> racism and hysterical hypocrisy amidst the existential ruins of a morally bankrupt and theologically bankrupt spirituality. We unabashedly declare with the Apostle Paul, his intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the high places, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Jesus Christ our Lord. We have called this press conference in part because we realize that to ignore this reality, that is to say the pivotal role of race and spirituality in our present malaise is to court disaster in the upcoming midterm election. America, we have a problem. Yeah. Stated succinctly, yeah. the American Republic is in crisis. Yeah. In light of this crisis, we are compelled to remind America and her leaders of some essential truths. Number one, authentic and integral leadership is not pandering to public opinion in such a crisis. It may call for the sacrifice of mundane personal preoccupations with one's political career on the sacred altar of the common good. Two, journalism is not treating both sides of an issue as equally valuable because they appear to be held by two or more opposing but substantial parties, but rather in subjecting both sides equally to the truth, regardless of who comes out ahead in the assessment. We reject the notion that an opinion or a position is of equal worth just because someone, usually white, happens to hold it. Lord, Three, no kingdom divided against itself can stand. We believe this government cannot endure permanently half suffering arbitrary state surveillance, subjugation, and cruelty, and half free. Four, it is absolutely crucial to vote, but we hasten to add that it is not enough to remind people of an abstract obligation to vote. It is time for the powers to be, to give the people a positive reason to vote, and I'm speaking particularly of black people. No version of the politics of fear is acceptable, relying on cheap, morally tinged rhetorical tricks 
and manipulation instead of dealing practically with substantial issues, particularly on race questions, is what got us back in this position in the first place. That's right. Five, the presidency of Donald Trump is not the cause of the American malady, but a symptom, a consequence, an effect. Although by the by, abate, uh, uh, by aid and aiding and abetting the present administration has made the sickness uh, worse and given certain racial dynamics license. Six, it is Christian heresy to call any nation that forsakes the needy, the sick, the poor, or mistreats the foreigner in their midst blessed. This is to say the policy and practices of the current administration and the party in power are clearly and irredeemably antichrist. Seven, you can identify the true Christian church by what it identifies with. The true church identifies with the poor, the prisoner, and the oppressed, the vulnerable and the at risk, the sick and the disabled, the lost and the mentally ill. The Christian church cedes preeminence and affirms the primacy of the kingdom of God in all matters finite and eternal. The body of Christ does not identify with the interest of empire. It does not identify with the principle of profit or power over persons. Right. It does not identify with racial supremacy. That's it. No true Christian believer prioritizes patriotism over piety That's it. or That's assumes it. a false equivalence between God and country. Yeah. The identification with Christ and his kingdom supersedes and relativizes all other worldly commitments. So, as one who never turned his back but marched breast forward, never doubted clouds would break, never dreamed the right or worsted wrong would triumph, Hell we fall to rise, our baffled to fight better and sleep to wait. Here we stand, we cannot do otherwise, so help us God. Thank you. We want to take a moment now to uh, receive any questions from the media, essentially, but from anyone who may be in the audience. This statement, this declaration, is a foundation on which the Social Justice Commission of the Progressive National Baptist stand. We will move forward from this base, from this foundation. You've heard clearly in the statement that voting is essential, but it is not the primary reason for this statement. You heard that we will not be the pawn of the left or the right. That's right. And you heard that we will, and the only organization that we have currently, work through our progressive convention to mobilize our churches and the people in them to address themselves in a truthful way to the crisis that we face today. But you heard also that the crisis that we face today is not one that's connected to one personality. That's right, right. It is connected to a, a, an underground stream, if you will, yeah. that has given rise to many challenges uh, and many to come. So we want to take your questions. <laughs> if you have any, please raise them, and we will try to address ourselves to them. Yes, sister. Yeah, Adele Bangford is in News Service. Can you talk about what? Thank you. Adele Bangford is in News Service. Could you talk about what happens after this declaration, especially between now and the midterm elections, and what happens after the midterm elections? What does this mean? What will you do that will be different besides the, the words you stated today? Well, I know, first of all, let, let me say this. One of, the, one of the things that we often do in America because of our pragmatic heritage is we want to move quickly to, well, what's the solution? Part of the problem in America is you don't understand the problem. You haven't understood the problem. You haven't acknowledged the problem. And so the move to solutions are always premature. One of the things we have to come to terms with is that the act of understanding the predicament we're in is as significant as coming up with any strategy to deal with the sort of superficial uh, manifestations of the problem that we see on a daily basis. 
Having said that, we want to get out the vote. It is important for churches to mobilize people all over the country to get out the vote and to organize more than just the people in churches, but use the resources available to us as church folk to mobilize the community to respond creatively to the challenge that we're facing by voting. But voting is not enough. We're going to have to deepen our understanding of our predicament so we can then move to some uh, uh, more strategic approaches to dealing with the structural reality and the systemic evil that we face on a daily basis. Because we, we've shown that even changing uh, the faces of policemen or the races of policemen is not enough to overcome the systemic reality of oppression and brutality directed at poor black and minority people find that black policemen often participate systemically in the same kind of disproportionate That's use of violence against black folk that white policemen do. So it's not enough just to change faces, it's not enough just to get some black elected officials, and, it's, and it certainly is enough those black elected officials buying the same ideological approach that tends to minimize and reduce black people's moral claims to a political interest. So we're gonna have to do more than just get out the vote so we can f fulfill our function in, the, in, in whichever party we have to be affiliated to, we're going to have to begin to look at those parties, whoever they are, and come to terms with the fact that they are participating in systemic uh, um, expropriation of rights and, and deterioration of quality of life for blacks as well. In other words, we've got to hold everybody accountable above and beyond just the election. And also, there's another piece of strategy that Dr. Uh, Butts is going to speak to, to speak to the long-term systemic reality. One of the things we're concerned about in this capitalist system is the lack of capital that's available to people of African <laughs> descent. Um, we know that in order to make it in a capitalist system, you have to have the ownership of capital and the means of production. And we have traditionally been denied that. One of the things that has hurt us really badly in terms of, shall we say, home ownership has been uh, the subprime mortgage scandal. One of the worst things that happened to black and brown people in the United States of America. And so we want to face, we want to hit that head on. And we want to begin to take a look at the banks that have been the major culprit in luring in particularly black and brown people, uh, particularly in the Northeast and in the West. One of the major culprits in this has been Wells Fargo Bank. So our eyes uh, are focused sharply on that bank. And uh, we will be taking some action, and we'll be asking our churches to focus on action against uh, these banks, I will say. Because I will give you one illustration of uh, a black faith organization that owned a major piece of property in New York City. And uh, the bank that I mentioned moved against them. They used the black face up front. But that property was then removed from them without the proper consideration, having heaped on huge fees and then sold to someone who was not a part of our community. This is terrible. And by the way, <clears throat> there were clergy persons who participated in this sham. These are the kinds of things that we have to note and we have to point out to our people across this nation. And because capital is so important, who's going to rebuild the poor community? Who's going to provide the affordable housing? Who's going to make sure that this booming economy is booming for everybody? Yeah. And always remember that when this economy booms, it is usually at the exploitation of black and brown people. Question. Yes, Faye Williams, WPFW-FM Radio 89.3. I just want to ask if you will be inviting other organizations to participate with you. I know you're taking the lead in this um, issue, but will you be appointing and how will other people uh, join you? Uh, yes, we have, in fact, we have some. Uh, you want to take that down? No. We, they, <coughs> Dr. Williams, thank you very much. Your presence here certainly gives us great encouragement, mm -hmm. and we would uh, invite you to participate with us. Um, I'm just overjoyed to see Dr. Amos Brown here because uh, we are one, um, and the National
International Baptist Convention of the United States of America Incorporated is important to us. And uh, even though we left them many years ago uh, to have uh, a representative of their social action committee here says something about us reaching out. We have a representative from the Church of God in Christ says something about us reaching out. But the leadership from this must come, for this, must come from Progressive National Baptist Convention because it is from the memory uh, of, of the legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that we get our strength. Thank you. Reverend Anthony Evans with the National Black Church Initiative. Um, as you know, Dr. Butts, um, I visited uh, you a couple of weeks ago, and I told you that a month ago, the National Black Church Initiative took the lead and um, declared a national boycott against Wells Fargo. Because once we did our homework and saw what they, saw what they did in our community, and also saw what the federal regulators did not do, that there's so much work. In addition to that, as you well know throughout what's going on, they continue to steal. So only on a moral basis, as a man of God and as, as the religious organization, that we have to speak to that. But also, um, cri critical to that, we must get our money back from Wells Fargo. And we are committed to do that. And I'm, I'm happy to join with you and everybody else who I know and love. There are, uh, I mentioned Wells Fargo um, as one example of many banks that have participated in this. Um, I applaud your action and join you in that, but I have uh, avoided the use of the term boycott, at least for us at this particular time. As we continue to research and look deeply into the, um, the uh, into all of the banks, because this is, uh, dearly beloved, a huge problem in our communities, not only for our churches, but for our development organizations, for all of us who want to provide services and particularly housing. I can't say uh, how it is in San Francisco, though I would dare to guess. I can't say how it is in Birmingham, though I would dare to guess. I can't say how it is in Washington, D.C. Oh, I can say, because I've seen that firsthand. Yeah. And I've seen New York City firsthand. Yeah. And I've watched how the availability of housing for poor families has deteriorated and how we have not been able to keep up with the continuing rise in rents, the cost of condominiums, and been able to get mortgages. This should concern us all. And we should not be ashamed of the word poor because one thing that certainly unites Americans, most of us, 90% or more of us, is that we are poor. People try to hide behind the term uh, middle class, <laughs> but middle class does not really describe it. And it's not only poor black people. Poor unites us across the board. Uh, I drive through New York in white neighborhoods, Jewish neighborhoods, uh, Latino neighborhoods, and I see lots of poor people trying to make it day by day. We need access to this capital, and this capital must be, it's our sweat equity, brother. That's it. That's right. It's our sweat equity. Yeah. This nation would not <coughs> even have dared to think about greatness, as I said once. It, uh, because it's great, it had me working 250 years Lord have and mercy. never paid me a dime. Lord have mercy. That's our capital. That's our money. So our elected representatives, they have to get that money into our community. They have to call these banks down. And rather than paying fees to the government, those $1 billion fees, $13 billion fees, $2.5 million fees, $400 million fees, ought to go back into poor communities. Questions? Questions? Dr. C.H. Johnson, pastor of the Christ Missionary Baptist Church, Fort Washington, Maryland. And a warrior. <laughs> and a warrior. And also serve as the moderator and leader for the Mount Bethel 
Baptist Association of some 50 churches throughout the DMV. Uh, Dr. Butts, I know you said very clearly you wouldn't mention boycott, but can you say what your position is on reparation <laughs> after those 250 years of uh, building America and no payment? Well, this is exactly what I'm talking about. And, I'm, and uh, somebody, a village news nurse, asked us, you know, what would be the action plan? And I think Dr. Johnson said it very well. You know, it's going to take consultation, and we have to really understand the problem. But on the question of reparate, that's our reparation. Yeah. When this money, Community Reinvestment Act, worked a little bit, mm -hmm. we need more of that. All right. And we're not going to get that from this administration. That ties into voting. Mm -hmm. uh, Community Reinvestment Act uh, did some of that. But there needs to be a lot more that forces these banks that have capital. They have so much money tied up now that should be dispensed to poor communities for housing, for schools, for infrastructure repair, to us. Yes, sir. And they should use the faith-based communities yes, yes. because we've been around the longest and we represent the most trusted and the most stable uh, mm -hmm. uh, institutions in our communities. Yes. So uh, reparations, yes, I see that as, as I said, as our, that money, <coughs> the capital, as ours. Mm -hmm. We earned it and it ought to go back. I don't think it just should go back willy-nilly. I think that people ought to have a plan, right. but we should have it set up so that that money is reinvested, and not enough of it is. And uh, we'll call the time when we feel like we've been fully repaid. You know, But right now, uh, whether it's uh, any of the large banks, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, take a look at all of them. And let's see if they are really investing this money. And our understanding of the equality and the distribution may be a lot different than their corporate understanding. Mm -hmm. Because their corporate understanding is what stole the money in the first place. Correct. Mm -hmm. So that's a part of our strategy. That really is. And beloved, we have to take a look at it. We have to take a look at it. We cannot be sidetracked on this. That money belongs to us. And let me just give you a personal example. When you rise to a point and you ask some of your brothers and sisters who have been instrumental in getting municipal dollars, state dollars, federal dollars, working with foundations and banks and insurance companies, you ask them, and real estate developers, Watch them, particularly in New York City. You think the NRA is bad. You ought to take a, stake, a look at the real estate lobby in New York. It is one of the most, uh, oh, ferocious and dangerous. We cannot let them off the hook here. Because, and, and see, they will say that it's a black thing. And they will use what Dr. Johnson has pointed out. I want you to ask more questions of him. You know, this dichotomy, well, you know, there's black people, and they will use hiding behind this kind of white supremacist that denies poor white people. Right, that's right. Poor white people. They're struggling. The only thing they have to say is, oh, we're not black here. <laughs> You're absolutely on target. And I see that as a way that we begin to get our 40 acres and a mule with interest. Keep the mule. Yeah, we also want to tie to why we had, had the uh, press conference. Because it's, it's tied into Columbus Day. That was not incidental. That was on purpose. Right. Because we need a whole post-colonial strategy that um, understands the international connections between blacks in the diaspora as well as the international connections of capital and exploitation of peoples of color. Uh, so this is uh, not just simply our 40 acres and a mule. Uh, it, it extends beyond that. It's uh, the relationship of uh, white supremacy, white uh, uh, multinational and global rule since the 17th century, 16th century to this present hour, and the exploitation of peoples of color for the purposes of their own enrichment. And it's way past time that we demand our fair share of what was taken from the earth, what was taken and extracted from our bodies, and what has been extracted from 
our nations or our countries, our lands around the world. And so this is this is very much about not only the international uh, dimension of capital, but also the international dimension of our struggle. Jeff Banks, pastor of the East Washington Heights Baptist Church here in Washington, D.C. Uh, many of us are really uh, with the confirmation of uh, Brett Kavanaugh as Supreme Court Justice. Uh, and we know that the Supreme Court is of critical importance to the well-being of African Americans over time. We can look back at Ho uh, Plessy uh, versus Homer or the Dred Scott decision or even Brown versus the Board of Education. We look back at, at Dred Scott and note that it was a justice from Maryland who said, Roger Taney, who said that the black man has the rights that the government has to respect. Now we have a new justice from Maryland who's been appointed to the court. And there are issues of voting rights, there are issues of affirmative action that speak to the core well-being of us as African Americans. The question is, as a church convention, what can we do? We, we heard the call that we need to vote. What can we do to heighten the call to vote? Because we had a similar call back in 2016. We even had our president from Michigan. And if, if we had just gotten a few more of our folk out to vote, we could have had a, a different outcome. What, what can we do to heighten the call of urgency to get our churches and our people to vote, one? And two, do we need to make a statement about uh, the Supreme Court? Dr. Amos Brown. Uh, we've asked him to address this issue, representing social action from the National Baptist Convention. Thank you, Dr. Butts, and thank you, Dr. Matthew Johnson, for calling this press conference. And I want to acknowledge at the outset, before I give my response, that it is significant, President Stewart, that we're meeting this afternoon. Yeah, I looked around the room and I gathered that there are possibly 20 preachers here. It was on January the 12th, 1865, after General Sherman and Secretary of War staff had gone down to Atlanta burned down Atlanta because the Confederacy would not give up. They were on their way to Savannah, marching to the sea. Yeah. And as they marched to the sea, these ex-enslaved people followed Sherman and Staten. Staten looked at General Sherman, Dr. Barton Williams, Scannon Williams, and asked, what are we going to do? with these ex-slaves. Stanton said to General Sherman, wait until we get to Savannah and we will call a meeting of black preachers. <clears throat> and on that night, Dr. Lovett, they met in, Dr. in Sherman's hotel room, 20 black preachers were together. <laughs> Reverend Garrison Frazier was a spokesperson. General Sherman looked at Reverend Frazier and said, what does the Union owe these ex-slaves? The old preacher said, well, I can't speak for everybody, General, but it appears to me that since we've been slaving on all of this land for all of these years, at least we should have 40 acres and a mule. So we will be able to take care of our families, educate our children, and empower our communities. And ladies and gentlemen, from that conversation, from that response, <coughs> General Sherman issued field order number 15 that set aside Fort Acres and Mule yeah. from the coast of Florida up to South Carolina to Georgia and Alabama. But unfortunately, that bad man from Tennessee Andrew Johnson became president after Mr. Lincoln was assassinated. And he revoked field order number 15.
And that's what threw us into the peanut system, sharecropping. Yeah. We had gotten our 40 acres and a mule back then, Brother Moline. There would not be this issue of economic deprivation, possibly, in the black community in these United States of America. And I thought I would just drop that quick history on you right. and say that as we move forward today, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If we would just take the 20 that we have on hand here yeah. mm -hmm. and respond to what Johnson has so eloquently written yes. as he should have as a Morehouse man. <laughs> <laughs> and do what needs to be done. Yeah. You all remember Sweet Daddy Grace, number yeah. one. Oh, yeah. Had those long fingernails, yeah. long hair. That was Al Sharpton's eye on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> Half his hair long enough and didn't want to be in the beauty shop too much. <laughs> but Sweet Daddy Grace was once asked by a white reporter. Dr. Williams, yes, sir. how is it that you have all these people following you? You never went to seminary, you didn't go to college, uh -huh. you were just a cook on the ship. <laughs> he said, how do you do all of this? All these homes you can have down, up and down the eastern seaboard, right. feeding these people, clothing these people. Right. And old sweet daddy looked at him and said, well, boy, there's a simple answer to that. I just learned how to tangibilitate the gospel. <laughs> he created a new word, tangibilitating the gospel. Yeah, yeah. Brother Matthew has given us a concept, has given us a theological foundation and the biblical statement. But now, as it regards the tangibilitation of it, though, yes, sir. Yes, sir. let me say, number one, we've got to deal with this voter suppression of black people. We have others who are, but, but for specifically us, they have done the thing that's our right to have, and that's the right to vote. Mm -hmm. And as time's up, permit me to, to delve into this deeply, but we got to really vote like hell yeah. in this midterm election and in 2020 yeah. and get rid of this excuse, my one vote won't count. Yeah, right. Every vote counts. Yeah, right. yes, sir. And we got to get that over to our congregations. Number two, we got to see that what happened at that Supreme Court was the exploitation, dehumanization of womanhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. Wow. yeah, yeah. And that goes across the board. That's right. We got to see that judgment begins in the house of black folk, That's yeah. Right. Yeah. black churches, mm -hmm. who gotten out there and ain't been cloned mm -hmm. by the chauvinism of this counterfeit thing called Christianity. Mm -hmm. We got to come to grips with that. Yeah. We got to deal with these preachers in black pulpits yeah. mm -hmm. who are still, though they don't call our women she dogs, right. but they treat our women treat yeah. as if they were dogs. Yes, sir. And what happened to Dr. Ford yeah. was despicable exactly. and it never should have happened. Yeah. So we got to stand up for her and say, we believe you. Yes. And this man, this judge, wasn't doing nothing but telling a lie. Yeah. Kept twitching his nose like a rabbit. Uh -huh. Mama always told me when somebody twitches their nose like that, you can tell they're lying. They're not telling the truth. <laughs> they kept drinking all of that water. Yeah, yeah. And then they did not let this so-called investigation by the FBI be open. That's right. How are you going to investigate something and get to the truth? But you can raise only a certain question. Yeah. It was nothing but a plan and a scheme to support white male privilege in this nation. They are running scared, and they saw an opportunity to get this fellow on that court who was against the voting rights bill, who was against every measure of justice and inclusion that was for black people, that's what the bottom line issue was. 
So let's just stand, debilitate the gospel, and get with it, and get behind the progressives, and the National Baptist Convention USA Incorporated is with them 10,000%. And in addition to that, I'm going to pass out a document where well, last week, see, we got to get friends all across the board, all over, all walls, and all lines. Yeah. I just came from Salt Lake City, Utah, and as chair of the Inter-Religious Committee of the NACP, and as chair of the National Baptist Social Justice Commission, yeah. would you believe that concessions that we got out of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Yeah. They changed. Yes. They'll sing a new song. Yes, sir. They got a new walk and a new talk. Yes, and they have admitted that there were checkered instances in the past that they were engaged in racial ideas and practices. Mm -hmm. Let me say this here real quick, Now I'm going to be through it. You got to look up state New York. In 1833, 1838 brother, the Mormons were in the leadership of the abolitionist movement. But as they trek westward, like many folks will do, you get in Rome, you do like the Romans do. The Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints became acculturated at the time of the Compromise of 1850. And Joseph Smith, the son of the founder, was with the liberal group, Dr. Lovett, but Brigham Young was the one, as they trekked further westward, who continued the racial policies of this nation wow. and made sure that Utah was admitted as a slave state. Mm -hmm. right. That's the accurate history. Right. But they have agreed to work with the NACP to deal with employment, economic empowerment, social justice, cultural exchanges, education, so that we have another ally. And that's the reason why it's good to see Rabbi Jack Moline here from the Interfaith Council, because in this struggle, we got to have everybody, all hands on deck. Let me say, um, and we're gonna wrap up, that in the state of Georgia, I'm sorry, in the state of Georgia, today, October 9th, the last day for voter registration for the upcoming election. In the state of Hawaii, October 9th. In the state of Michigan, October 9th. Now Massachusetts is the 17th and in Missouri it's tomorrow. I think I've just picked up these uh, dates from the Times today. And so I want to emphasize that this conference is to, especially as the question was asked, talk about the fact that through the Progressive National Baptist Convention with partners, with partners, yes. we will continue the efforts that already exist as well as focus on our own concerning voter registration, education, and mobilization in those states where we can. We've got a black woman running for governor in Georgia. Yes, We've got a black man running for mayor of Montgomery, Alabama. We've got another black man running, is it for uh, governor, governor of Florida? Florida. Florida. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So we've got some key races, and we have churches in these areas. We can only do what we can. And I like that Dr. Brown talked about the fact, see friends here, shout all over, that uh, we got 20 people here, Baltimore. But you know that passage, you know, I love that passage, <coughs> particularly when we come to times like this, that Zechariah. I can't remember four, I think. And he said, despise what? Not uh -huh. these small beginnings. Yeah. For the Lord is pleased mm -hmm. to see the work begin. Mm -hmm. And I'm committed, beloved. I have 20 years as a college president, 46 years at Abyssinian Baptist Church. Oh, wow. So we, we don't have anything to do but to give yeah. mm -hmm. of ourselves to this struggle. Yeah. And we are committed to it. And as I look around and see old friends, 
I've dated with my friends way back when we were a lot younger, so I know they committed to it also. Oh, yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll be on the battlefield. I'm going to bring Reverend Johnson back for some final questions, and then we'll wrap up. Brother George Gilbert, Holy Trinity United Baptist Church, Washington, D.C. In the context of the civil rights movement that you uh, really, uh, gave us, and understanding that the black community in America only has uh, owns two institutions, the church and, and universities. Many times there is a great divide between the old and the young. And uh, sometimes I'm a son of a pastor, I would be the youngest in the room and wondering why. I used to be that guy. Yeah, well, you understand. <laughs> Will there be an effort to get our black colleges on board and connected with this movement? Oh, oh, absolutely. Yes. Um, uh, without question, without question, we need and we need to we need to speak directly to some of our young people, and we need to use some young preachers and some young organizers, uh, both male and female, uh, to do that. So that definitely will be be a part of our, our overall strategy. Uh, and need to uh, one one thing I do want to say uh, in response to uh, Dr. Brown and if there's more questions. And that is this, that the outrage against Kavanaugh should have been well underway when Dr. Ford's concern, claim, victimization was made public. If we have been true to our ideals and those on the left have been consistently committed, the outrage would have began when we became aware of his um, pernicious and malicious record on legal decision with respect to race, mm -hmm. but nobody moved because they don't respond to us and our concerns. <clears throat> but a robin redbreast in a cage sets all the world at rage. And so when particularly a white woman spoke up, mm. it rallied the country, including many of us, to her cause. But if the accumulated effort had been such as it should have been, we may have prevailed when her victimization was made public. But there wasn't that concern when it was over his race record on issues of race. That's the problem that we have with the liberal left. Mm -hmm. And that's the same problem black women are going to have when white women get their freedom mm -hmm. and the race issue isn't dealt with. So we got the nuance to understand our peculiar position and not consistently allow ourselves to become duped as the, and make the head of the left liberal <laughs> ideological spear without demanding the appropriate dignity be dealt to black issues. Yeah. And I just want to point that out. And as we meet, uh, I want to make it clear that uh, my own personal experience in New York, where we supposedly have a progressive mayor, and we continually watch how that progressiveness is not really, even in, it has a, 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 that progressiveness is not reflected in the empowerment of people of color. We are not pawns to the liberal. We are not dupes for the conservative left. We are the Progressive National Baptist Convention Incorporated. And we are black preachers. Yeah. And we have our own view of the gospel message, which is the only authentic view. Mm -hmm. And people like Jerry Falwell Jr., yeah. Franklin Graham, yeah. and yeah. Paul yeah. White. Pa yeah, Paul yeah. White, you know, the heretics, <laughs> as far as we're concerned, Absolutely. hypocrites. And, uh, and we need to uh, be unafraid to say this That's wow. and, um, and stand firmly on who we are. Uh, Dr. King did that. He came for it with his life. And we must stand on that memory and that legacy. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted that you would join us today. Um, do we have anybody else? Well, I'm delighted that uh, we, we're glad to see Rabbi Moline, but we're happy to have him here. But we're delighted to have all of you with us.
with us today. And uh, I thank you for sharing. And uh, listen now, we'll be in touch with you. But holler back, please. <laughs> holler back. Let us know that you're here and with us. And uh, the individual churches, what are you, who's, who's mine? We're on Facebook. I just want you to say something to the Facebook audience. To the uh, Facebook yes, audience. Yes. Thank you for joining us. Yes. We're delighted. And President Stewart, if you're there and you're watching us, thank you for the opportunity to serve. The church militant is on the move. And you are our illustrious leader. Thank you so much. And I want you to say and give appreciation to a dynamic scholar, uh, a well-educated man, and who will be a major part of the architecture of our continuing movement, and that is the Reverend Dr. Matthew Johnson. Yeah. Dr. Body, we'll let you close. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Butts, and thank all of you again for, for coming to us. The hour is well spent, and we thank God for your presence on today. I've asked uh, our second vice president, Dr. Keith Bird, if you would come and to just lead us in a word of closing prayer uh, as we have received our marching orders, uh, so let us march. Thank you, Dr. Friday. And again, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise for these two giants and Dr. Tucker and Dr. Johnson. And certainly, we thank everybody for being here today. And on behalf of our president, and hopefully he's watching, Dr. Stewart, our first vice president, David Peoples, uh, I love that the church militant is on yeah. the move. Let us stand now as we prepare to leave in prayer. And as we stand, I hope you don't mind me saying, Dr. Baltimore, I'm so proud to be progressive. <laughs> Let us look to the Lord in prayer. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on the way, thou who has by thy might led us into the light. Keep us forever in the path, we pray. God, we thank you for this mountaintop experience. Some have called it the National Press Club, but this day it has become a mountaintop from which a clarion call has gone forth that we are still here, <coughs> that we are still unmoved and still unashamed to proclaim to the world that justice is still the order of the day, that righteousness is still that which must be the order of the day as well, and that we will not rest, we will not stop, we will not sleep until that is in fact the case. We thank you God for our chieftain in the person of Dr. Timothy Stewart. We thank you God for his vision that has been caught and run with by Dr. Butts and Dr. Johnson who are leading this social justice effort. And we thank you God for our partners today. It is a blessing uh, today that the Progressive National Baptist Convention as well as the National Baptist Convention stand side by side. Uh, to declare to the world that we are still together yeah. and we are still fighting the good fight uh, for justice and righteousness, not just for black people, uh, but for all people, yeah. uh, all humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, and God, we ask now that you give us your Holy Ghost power, mm -hmm. that you give us your strength. Yeah. For our strength will not be enough. Our intentions will not be enough. But if we're on your side, and if we're guided, God, by your hand, and if your provision and your resources are there at our disposal, we cannot lose. And so we leave this mountaintop experience and go down into the valley, valley reinvigorated and strengthened for the journey ahead. Help us now, God, to tangibilitize the gospel. Yeah. That it might have hands and feet, and that it might make a real difference in the lives of your people. Forgive us for being less than. And now God strengthen us as we seek to be more than. For we ask this in the name of our illustrious leader and first civil rights organizer, even Jesus the Christ. Jesus. And all of God's children said amen. 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 Thank you all for listening, uh, Facebook friends. Uh, I'll be sending you all a copy of the, uh, the entire service for those who came in late. But thank you so much. Uh, and... Uh, I think it was a good vision by the Progressive National 
Baptist Convention to try and get out and uh, get some things done that, um, that's been unsaid and been undone. So thank you again, and good to see all of you guys, and uh, God bless.